Good afternoon. Um, I'm Ed Corrin, and I'm here to introduce. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not the cartoonist who will arrive shortly. <laughs> Actually, the, the cartoonist has arrived, uh, and he's about to speak. He's urged me to be as short as I possibly can in all due modesty. But I will say that uh, a couple of things. One is that I've long admired James and James's genre of creativity uh, and his choice of it, the graphic novel. Um, uh, I've admired it because it's, he's a bit like an amphibian. Uh, it's an amphibian form in that uh, the genius that it requires one to write and draw at the same time is really, uh, for me, a remarkable one. And uh, his work is, is a wonderful amalgam and compendium of both skills. Um, so I urge you, uh, also, I just saw this outside, um, this wonderful book of his, which includes three of graphic novels, um, James Sturm's America. And it is as close to perfection of the art form as I can possibly think of. Um, so, uh, James started drawing, uh, as many of us did in college. Uh, I think it's, it's the kind of unpaid internship or, or paid internship that we've always had, uh, those of us in, in, the, in our profession. Uh, I know that Chris uh, Ware also started drawing in college, as did James, and uh, it's a way, it's a, like teething rings for us cartoonists, and we, we kind of get our our uh, gums all in good form for future life. And uh, his first work was uh, a cartoon strip for the University of Wisconsin at Madison newspaper. And from there on, he's gone, on, gone to a stellar career publishing uh, graphic novels, uh, a special edition of um, Marvel Comics, if I quite remember. And um, in addition to that, as, as a an extraordinary multitasker. He's established the Center for Cartoon Study, or co-established it with Michelle Ali down at White River Junction, which is arguably the, the most distinguished and best school uh, to teach what is generally thought of as unteachable. So, uh, but he does it, and he turns out an extraordinary group of students who have done an extraordinary amount of contributions to the, to the field. So, without more encomia to James, which, uh, I mean, I could go on for the full half hour. <laughs> uh, let me to introduce him, James Sturm, uh, cartoonist extraordinaire. Wow. Um, I gotta get Ed to introduce me to everything. All right, so um, I'm just gonna kind of, actually like a, a week ago we did a, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, this Pecha Chula, it's a Japanese, say that again? Pecha Pecha. I was so far away that I wasn't even close. Um, and it's a 20 slides, 20 seconds. So I put this together for that and it was a six minute presentation and I um, feel very relieved now that I have more than, than, than six minutes to, to talk about all this work. So um, we'll go through this little snapshot of my, of my career. All right, now that we've gotten to know each other. <laughs> I'm going to start with, uh, you know, my, my influences. The, the Fun with Peanuts book was, um, I still remember the day that I badgered my mother in the aisles of the Medi Mart drugstore in New City, New York, uh, to buy that for me. And Peanuts was a, a huge part of my childhood growing up. Um, there was many things that amazed me about Peanuts. Uh, one was, I was just very much aware that these were just shapes I was looking at, like a comma, a squiggle, a circle. But on the other hand, that was Charlie Brown. Um, and he had this interior life. And there was this tension between the abstraction and, um, and this true emotion, these real characters, uh, that they exist simultaneously. Uh, that I marveled at even as a kid and still marvel about. And I feel like that's a lot of where comics kind of get some of their, some of their energy. Um, and that the Peanuts characters had this life, like when you close the books, like they, they wandered off the panel and they, they still like 
um, you know, had dinner and did, did, did the things that they did, that they had this, this life of their own. And, uh, you know, I found out, I thought Peanuts was so great and few, few, few characters had, had a soul like, like, like those, those characters did. And then um, when I was first or second grade, I, I got this Fantastic Four from in Paramus Park, New Jersey, uh, another thing that I whined for until my parents bought it for me. And you could see this copy is much, much read. And uh, the superheroes were, were like this just larger than life opera that um, I just uh, became obsessed with and collected comics. And really up, up until I went to college, um, I was reading superheroes uh, nonstop. And when I got to college, uh, there was a, a cartoon, uh, excuse me, a, a guy who was 13 years older than I, uh, Victor Rayboy, and for those people who know the history of comics, yes, he was related to Mac Rayboy, uh, the Captain Marvel Jr. Uh, artist, amongst other things. And uh, I actually gave up comics when I first went to college. It was pre-internet. I thought, like, I, I was kind of coming to this realization that I couldn't draw that way. I was coming to the realization that if I walked around Madison, Wisconsin with a copy of the Fantastic Four in my arm, I would never get laid. Um, and the other thing is that the, the set of concerns that these superhero comics um, conveyed weren't my set of concerns anymore. And when Victor p heard I was into comics, he pulled out this huge box of underground comics, which he subsequently gave to me as a wedding gift, and it's like one of my most prized possessions. Uh, amongst this uh, box uh, was this Fritz the Cat, and in this collection of Fritz the Cat was a story called Fritz Bugs Out. And it was about Fritz um, just like just realizing that college wasn't for him and just decided to, you know, to drop to bug out and have an adventure. And it so spoke to where I was at. And actually the following semester I dropped out of undergraduate. <laughs> and I remember how concerned my parents were, <laughs> like that I'd never go back. And um, anyway, so that was a huge thing. And the other thing in that box was 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 undergrad what was Art Spiegelman's mouse. Well, excuse me, it, what Art's Mouse wasn't, but the work of Art Spiegelman was in there, and uh, and of course th that led me uh, eventually to, to 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 find Mouse. Not that it was easy to avoid a certain part if you loved comics, and this also spoke to just the scope, the ambition, um, the incredible intelligence uh, and heart that could that could go. This was like Mouse was like what a graphic novel could be, and and um, you know still perhaps or not perhaps is the high watermark of, 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 the, of the graphic novel, to, to use that phrase, which we've kind of uh, decided upon. The other huge, huge influence of, of, of mine back then was, was Mark Allen Stavity's McDoodle Street. He uh, did this uh, strip for uh, the Village Voice, um, uh, and it was um, about this time when I was like trying to figure out the type of cartoonist I wanted to be, or, or felt I couldn't be a cartoonist because I couldn't draw in a certain way. He kind of opened a door for me. Uh, he serialized this in the pages of the Village Voice, but he also saw this as a novel. And even on the cover, the, the famous comic strip novel from the Village Voice, and I actually got a chance to ask Mark whether that was his choice to say, um, to use that word novel, and he says it was, and he really did think of it as kind of like a Alfred Jarry surreal uh, graphic novel piece. And I'll, I'll just, I'm already talking too much about every slide because I just, um, very much um, adore uh, oh, this work, so meaning, meaningful to me. But w what I loved about um, McDoodle Street is that um, there was a sense of, of just kind of making it up as you go along, um, and there was also this kind of um, obsessive quality that he would put. It was like a, you know, like a, like a like Howard Finster folk artist uh, quality where you just, start drawing these little details. Anybody ever see his, um, the donuts book he did? Um, Too Many Donuts. Uh, he's done a bunch of children's books. He went on to do um, Washington and stuff for the New York Times book review. But uh, this strip, it, it, it made me realize that comics didn't have to look a certain way, that you could dive in, you didn't have to draw a certain way. Um, and uh, I just I just love, love the drawing, uh, his drawing. And it was really funny, too. Uh, and this led me to this uh, collection, th this, uh, I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison, and there was a, a, a daily newspaper strip, uh, well, Monday through Friday, and uh, I started becoming a daily cartoonist. Uh, I mean, not a real daily cartoonist, because I didn't have Sundays and Saturday, but um, five days a week, and this really was my cartooning education, so I could, you know, 
read about, you know, re read a piece of Crumb or, or uh, Crumb's work or someone else and immediately try to, uh, try to integrate it or, or, or maybe just, just copy it. <laughs> and I guess that's how I, how I learned. And uh, Down and Out Dog was, was really inspired by the underground comics. And I think the other thing that, that this uh, did, uh, this book, it, it was a very big university and it was a very uh, popular strip. And, and in fact, I, I might argue that this is the most popular work that I've ever done. Uh, so it gave me a sense of like, oh, I can do this. There's a living here. And it tricked me uh, to, and it got me to this place I'm at now. So perhaps I'm in, I'm in debt um, to this, this crazy dog character um, as well. Uh, and the other thing it did too, it kind of, um, I, I, I published this book and they, they did a, and I borrowed money from my parents to publish it and I, got, and I paid them back right away. And that was like a big thing too. It's like, they were like, my son, the author, you know, like I, I, I th that was a big deal, publishing a book and it kind of bought me some time with my parents. Although, although like many years later, um, when I was living in Philadelphia, when my wife was in graduate school, I mean, I, I had m more things published since then. It was after I had helped start this newspaper, which I'll talk about in a while. My younger sister just called me and said, I had a really weird conversation with dad. And I was like, what? And he was like, he was just wondering what you did all day. <laughs> I was like, well, those comics don't make themselves. Um, but anyway, uh, so this is Down Out Dog. And when I was there at the University of Wisconsin, I, I met um, this guy, t uh, Tim Keck, um, actually published this, this calendar for a fraternity where he asked me to like do like the, the days of the, 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 the months, like January, February, March. And then he would sell ads to the fraternities and all I had to do was like stay in my studio, smoke pot and draw little drawings of my, 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 my down and out dog character. And you know, he, he, a couple months later he brought me a check and it was like, wow, this is great. I, I love you, Tim. And then he said, well, now I'm gonna start this newspaper called The Onion with my friend Chris Johnson. Will you contribute some work to that? So um, I helped contribute uh, and, and help get this thing kind of uh, underway as well. And here are some of the very first uh, onions from, from, I guess, 1988, 1987, uh, around that time. Um, one of the things I did for the, in The Onion was I serialized a, a, a story about um, breakfast cereal characters. And I had done this weekly comic strip. I stopped that and I had this idea uh, to explore this relationship between culture uh, and agriculture. And I was very much influenced by uh, Wendell Berry's book, The Unsettling of America. Uh, at the time I had gone to, um, it was right before I went to grad school uh, and during grad school when I started this. Um, and, I, and I was also experimenting with my own diet. I was on a macrobiotic diet for a few years. Um, and, and these were the, the, the issues uh, that were kind of present in my life and, and as a cartoonist, that's how, that's how I work through these, uh, the, these issues. Uh, so these, this was a series I did for, for Fanographics books. Um, and I, I learned uh, how not to make a no graphic novel. It was a really not a very successful project, and, but I was really dogged to finish it. And I think by finishing it, I learned a lot. Also during this time, I was, um, became an intern at Raw Magazine, and this was a very important time for me as well, as I was able to, um, I still remember the day where I was asked to go into the stat room and uh, uh, take a stat of, of a chapter of Art's mouse. And he had this binder, and I pulled out this page of mouse, and then I saw this other draft underneath it, and beneath that, another draft, and I mean, I was in there like, you know, well over an hour when Bob Sikoriak, who is like my, my good friend now and supervisor, then he, he's like, are you okay in there? And I was like really seeing how art thought and I, I was like, okay, this is how you do it. And it was, it was um, I can't um, say enough about, about you know, just <laughs> that time shooting stats uh, and, and how much art has, has taught me about the process and, and kind of moving through my work. Um, from, from, from graduate school, uh, I finished graduate school and I moved out to Seattle. Uh, Tim had sold his steak in the onion and he moved on. He moved to Brazil for a year and then he's like, I'm going to Seattle and I'm gonna start a newspaper, come and be an art director. And um, I, I said yes, I didn't wanna stay in New York and I always actually dreamed of moving to Seattle. And uh, we started publishing The Stranger. I, I'm ashamed that I don't remember the, per the, 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 the alien humping the space needle cover. Um, Although I do remember he was the boyfriend in Julie Doucet's New York Diary. Um, 
but I don't I don't remember the name of him right now. But the artist on the right I, is one of my big influences in my life as a teacher, as a person, as a human being, is uh, Marshall Arisman. And I said, Marshall, can you do a cover? And he sent this drawing in that we that we put on the cover of, of this. Um, and it was just a great way. I, I dove into Seattle. It was such a cartoonist town. Uh, Fanographics was there, one of the great publishers of, of, of alternative comics. And um, it was just, uh, it was, um, it was an interesting time to be in Seattle. It was the early 90s. Uh, you know, everybody seemed to be moving there. The internet was this new thing. You know, the, the Dow Jones was climbing. Uh, the internet was going to bring everybody together. We were all going to hold hands globally and sing Kumbaya. And it really felt like, uh, yeah, there was like this kind of gold, gold rush mentality in the air that anything is possible. Um, two more covers of The Stranger. The one uh, with the telephone pole is by my good friend Jason Lutz, who I met out there who um, is now uh, a great cartoonist, uh, still a great cartoonist, and lives in Vermont, teaches at the cartoon school, and, and actually introduced me to my wife. So if, I, I owe him a debt of gratitude, f first and foremost, for that. Um, so going back to, to that idea of like what's possible, at, at the same time that I was out in Seattle thinking, like, you know, maybe I could live to being 300 years old, and, and what anything's possible, um, I was, I was Actually, through Marshall Arisman, I was, um, he used to tell these crazy stories about this psychic healer he used to see and uh, who lived on the West Coast. And I went to, uh, I, I said, Marshall, I'm, I'm out on the West Coast. I'd love to see this, this woman. And he's like, well, here's her number. You can make an appointment. And I called, and I left a message. And many months later, I got a, a call back from her husband, made an appointment. And I had this 13-year relationship with this woman, Karen Land. Um, and she was, um, it, it sounds crazy and weird, but she literally could see the insides of your body as clearly as she could tell you what color shirt you're wearing. And, uh, and, and, and a lot of other things. And so I would go down there every four months, and it, it kind of blew my mind. And it took me a while to kind of wrap my brain around a world where people like her can exist and where you can talk about this without sounding like you're the real kook in the room. And um, I did this story, and it's actually maybe the favorite thing I've ever written. I can't really look at the art, but I, I, I still like the writing or, or um, the, the revival. And it's basically an exploration about the powers and limitations of faith, because this is what I was really thinking about, both living in Seattle in the internet boom and my relationship with Karen. And then what came the next piece, uh, and these are all parts of that um, James Sturm's America book, and whereas in the revival, everybody kind of looked towards the heaven for salvation, uh, and hundreds of people a day, like they just kind of went in the opposite direction. And I, I thought about one of these ghost towns and, and, and these abandoned ghost towns and imagined like who were the last people to leave and the, pe the last people that were just kind of greedily holding on to that dream of, of finding something. Um, and I guess in, in, in some ways it was about trying to yeah, think about the consequences of kind of like that profane pursuit of material wealth, which is, I guess, you know, 21st century <laughs> culture. But uh, And then the third part of the trilogy was this book called The Golem's Mighty Swing. Um, and it was about, about, you know, this barnstorming group of, um, a barnstorming group of Jewish baseball players in the 1920s. And what happens when, when, you come from another culture and become an American, what do you leave behind? What do you hold on to? Um, you know, in, in Jews, uh, during Passover, they say, next year in Jerusalem, it's about, you know, Jews about returning to the homeland. And in baseball, it's a book where you actually step up to something called home plate, and the whole object is to circle the bases and come back home. So I, you know, tidy little metaphor there that was already built in, and um, my, my hook, and, um, that was a little, a little about try to explore things like how, how, how media amplifies stereotype. And one of the things I like about comics, and that I guess I explored a little bit in, in uh, the Golem's Mighty Swing book, uh, was also the way that kind of this melting pot of American culture, the way comics and, and popular culture kind of, it's like an echo chamber. I, uh, I remember watching uh, a Simpsons episode with my daughter, and Homer is really big and climbs to the top of the Twin Tower, uh, uh, Empire State Building, and is flicking away planes. And uh, she was laughing her head off, and I said, "Oh, that's a really funny King Kong thing." She's like, "King Kong who?" And I, I remember reading Mad Magazine and not knowing what they were parroting, but still really loving it. And uh, there were golems in Marvel Comics growing up, and 
Um, all right, I've rambled on too long about that. But these are, these are uh, one, one is uh, a page from the book and the other page is, uh, I, I, this Shonen Championship manga was a really big influence. Um, a friend of mine, Matt Madden, was living in Mexico and he mailed me a whole bunch of, uh, of, these, of, these, of these manga and I don't speak Japanese, but I was able to really get involved in this team and you'd have 40 pages of a, of, a, of, a, of a pitcher trying to hold a runner on at first and like the, 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 the tension and drama of a single, of a single um, inning of, of a baseball game or an at-bat was just incredible. And, and in, like this page, I actually talk about this sometimes. Uh, I, I mean, I have like whole lectures around this one page about what, uh, how much information is embedded uh, just visually. Uh, and I tried to, um, you know, glean what I could from that in, in doing the, the Golem's Mighty Swing. Um, and it's funny, this is my, my little, my, my one, my, my pinnacle of my illustration career. And it, I kind of mention it like I, I, doing the Golem's Mighty Swing, I, I could have made more money sewing sneakers together in Indonesia in terms of the labor. Uh, and, then, and then you do like one New Yorker cover and it's like, what? Um, but, you know, then, then of course, like this was like beginner's luck. I did this one thing, it went really smoothly. And um, you know, the, after the first one, I was like, "Well, if I could do a New Yorker cover every other week, I could really." Uh... <laughs> but unfortunately, it doesn't. And this, this this cover makes no sense either now. But at the time, the Japan uh, he just retired, uh, Matsui. He was like the first big name Japanese player uh, from from the Japanese league to to sign in America, and the Yankees signed him. So this was like a nod to them signing uh, him. And it was funny, my. Um, it, uh, my friend Seth had this great story. It's not a great story. It's a sad story. Well, it's fine now because he subsequently did New Yorker covers. But at the time, he had won. He had planned a party for himself the night it was going to come out, and then the cover got bumped. And um, you know, I just I just had that picture of him in that room with all the party streamers and the balloons hanging low. So you know, and, and the the week that this was supposed to come out was opening day, and then it was bumped uh, because of the the Iran war. Oh, curses the Iran war. They bumped my New Yorker cover. Uh, anyway, uh, so, so I didn't think it was going to run, and then they ran it next week, and I was so surprised uh, that it actually went. So anyway. And then I, I, I was traveling after the Golem's Mighty Swing book, and I thought, like, well, while I'm on the road, I, really, I didn't think I could really work on anything of, of, that was pulling out of my soul, so to speak. Or, uh, so I thought I always wanted to do a, this Marvel comic that was my fir one of my first loves, and surprisingly, they let me do what, pretty much what I wanted to do. Um, and I learned about working collaboratively, what I liked about it, what I didn't. These are covers by a cartoonist named Craig Thompson and uh, a guy named Guy Davis uh, did the inside. So I, I did a series of uh, kind of slice of life. It took, you know, I don't even talk about this, not even worth it. Okay, so about this time, <laughs> about this time, uh, I, I had moved to Vermont and I had a child and I was thinking, um, I really don't have a, I, 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 I don't, I, how do I earn a living, you know, and, and what am I going to do? And I got a, a couple of interviews at uh, art and design schools and I, and, um, and, and actually I'll, I, I remember there was a, the cartooning program at this one art and design school, which will go nameless. They, they, they brought me in for an interview and uh, the woman whose department I was going to be in, she, she, was, she was a graphic design, she, you know, she, she taught graphic design, but she was the department head and she, she was talking about comics and it was clear she didn't really value them or like them. And in the same city that night, I don't think I've ever told you this story, Chris, but you were speaking somewhere that night uh, and I was leaving that day and I said, oh, you're going to go see so-and-so speak. And she, she kind of like was, an, oh, no, I don't think. She was like casually dismissing somebody whose work, uh, just as a cartoonist, as a, as a designer. And I thought, I will not work. I don't want to work for this woman. Um, and uh, anyway, so I got back to Vermont, and I had to figure out what to do. And um, I thought, um, it's, Vermont's very small, and you're only like one, you know, one degree of separation from everybody. And my friend uh, Matt Dunn, uh, who some of you may know from his political um, activity, um, he started, you know, making some introductions, and um, I, I had a chance to go in front of the state senate and try to get some money to fix up this old department store. And um, I, when I was on the Golem book tour, it was during uh, when my friend Seth had this vernacular drawings book, and I was so s stunned and so beautiful. And there was a quality to his work that really reminded me of White River Junction. So uh, not only did I did he do this drawing for us, um, he did some um, he did our first brochure, 
And so this was part of this like thing to present to the state house. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I'll start a cartooning school. And I, I have to say this, people are like, oh, you started, you started school, that's, you know, where did that come from? And it really comes almost out of this comics thing. It's like, as a cartoonist, I always felt like you don't have to wait till somebody to validate you. You can draw it yourself and go to back then Kinko's and staple something together, and, and that's, how you, that's how you do it. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I can apply that same mentality to, to this educational thing. And uh, I had taught at a place that seemed a bit of a racket. And I thought, well, you know what? My place might be a bit of a racket too, but I think it'll be a more transparent racket. And um, so I, I just started, it was a time before the economic down, you know, went, you know, the economy went belly up and people were rooting for White River Junction. And so I, I, I started, I, I started to down that route. Um, Right before I opened the school, I was approached, um, I was sitting at the D&Q table in San Diego and I was signing and this woman came and handed me her card and from Hyperion Disney and wanted me to do a book about Houdini and I, I referred her to my friend Jason Lutz who loves Houdini and she's like, well, would you do another one? And long story short, I thought, well, all those, the little red bars say this, the Center for Cartoon Studies presents. So I wrote one of these, the Satchel Page, and, and there's a couple of these that are, are really great, the Thoreau, I mean, they're all good. Uh, the bar's really low, though, for historical fiction biocomics, though, I have to say out there. So they're all, they're all solid. Um, but the Annie Sullivan, Helen Keller book is a work for the ages, and, and the Thoreau Walden book by John Parcelino is incredible, too. Um, but I, I kind of was the editor or uh, series editor and then specific editor for some of them, and Jason took over some of the editing as well. Uh, so I did this, you know, to, to make some books and to also like it was again when you start a school and people are coming to like a small town in Vermont, it, it, it kind of um, oh well they've done this thing with Hyperion. There's there's this. It was funny even like when that New Yorker cover came out, it was so well timed because it's like yeah, uh, Golem's Mighty Swing might have gotten some attention, but nobody really knows who that what, what that was. But when when somebody wanted to introduce me to maybe a potential donor or, or, or somebody, they'd say oh he did a New Yorker cover, and all of a sudden it was like okay. I'll meet that guy, you know. There's a glow, right, right, Ed? <laughs> All right. Um, and then from the school, like, like one of the things we do at the school is like we're, we're always like thinking about curriculum and creating curriculum and, and, and how to teach the stuff to break it down. And uh, one of the books I use is this, uh, and I, I should have a slide of it, Ed Emberley, and he shows you how to use like these simple little pictograms to create, um, you know, to, to, to make characters and, and objects. And it's a really great book, and I loved it as a kid. And I thought, well, okay, now that you've made the little pictures, like, how do you put them into action? So this Adventures in Cartooning was kind of like this kind of half Scott McCloud understanding comics and half Ed Emberley make a world. And um, so these are a bunch of ones that, uh, uh, that we've done uh, over the years. And it's just great. It's great. Um, I feel like I have a connection, like a, a connection with the audience with these in a way that, like, there's no eight-year-old that, like, huh. Somebody blurbed this. I'm going to buy this book. Um, you know, it, it's funny because some books you do, and 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 it's you know, okay. You know, the, the librarians might like it, or it might get nice reviewed. But you you, you know when there's like a a little crackle about it. And and um, I've, I've been. I feel like I, I said this earlier. I feel like it's like some little lightning in a bottle with these, and it's been really fun to do. And uh, also. What's really fun is like I, I, I did these when my kids were young, so they were part of it, and I see a lot of my kids and the characters. And I, 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 I was working on this YA novel for a little bit, and I realized now that that a lot of it's like a, my a, as I'm hitting different audiences, I think it's a way to connect with my kids as they as they get older as well. Um, so I, I hit 40, and I'm and I'm not. <clears throat> addicted to pornography or alcohol or drugs or gambling. Uh, but I, at some point I realized like I, I'm, I'm checking my, well I didn't have a phone then, but I'm, I'm constantly online all day and I feel it changing and affecting me. And I I'd started kind of doing work for Slate, some columns, and I, I, I kind of wanted to hold my feet to the fire and I thought if I did this thing for Slate where I went offline for four months um, and then blogged about it. Um, <laughs> Well, so I, I would write, you know, like I think I did 10 columns over the course of four months where I would write and I had a, and, and do some illustrations and then somebody would, I, I'd put it on a thumb drive and a, 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 one of my students would, would then send it to my editor at Slate and he would fax me back and we'd go back and forth a little bit. But it was a really um, amazing experience about trying to figure out like my relationship with the internet and um, how that's kind of affecting. And it was, it was really a, felt like a vacation for four months. It was 
it was in, it was very interesting, and it also it also felt like it touched a. Ner I, I don't think I was alone in how I was uh, feeling about this. I got a lot of letters and very sad correspondences um, about people feeling really trapped. And 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 it was one interesting. Everybody thought there was like this digital divide, like these natives, these young people, that it's less oppressive to them. They're they're used to it, and it wasn't the case at all. I would say just as many, if not more, were from people in their their twenties. All right, I'm going to go through a little quicker because what, what? How are we on time? I'm sorry. I'm okay, quarter to. Um, so I, I did a book about Market Day. Um, it's about a character who kind of has lived a charmed life. That like his calling and his career were one and the same, and then this is the one day where where that road sort of forks. And I didn't bring too many, uh, but there was a lot of there. There was one artist in. in Many, many the Roman Vishniak, um, Alter Katzne, um, who's a, a uh, these are two photographers who, who took photos of Eastern Europe. And one of the things that struck me is when I was looking at Vishniak and Katzne, is like I would look at these photos and all I would see was victims. You know, I, I would just see people that was like, oh, chances are, you know, they were they were murdered. Um, and then I would look at people from like the WPA photographers, um, you know, from Dorothy Lang and Walker Evans et al. And and you know they had a similar aesthetic, black and white. People kind of you know down and out. But you look at their photographs and you see people that are better than their circumstances. And the WPA were taking you know you look at those photos and and there's you see it through this historical lens where you start saying like those people they probably got a new deal, you know. And then you look at the Jews and I and I, I felt there's something very as soon as you look at somebody and and you just relegate them to victimhood. Um, I, I, it just felt wrong, so I wanted to take those little photos that I looked at and kind of reanimate them through comics and make them alive. And, and no one would accuse Market Day from being upbeat, but at least the tra tragedy isn't the Holocaust. Um, although, of course, you can't talk about this world without that kind of looming over the whole, the whole piece. And um, and there were other artists that I really and, and the, the, the other two artists I would mention that really affected this was. Um, Raphael Sawyer, specifically his prints, he has this like really muted quality of people, like you're, you're catching somebody at this moment of repose, somebody just like catching a breath before they steal themselves to like move back into the scrum of life. And I wanted to do what he does, his prints, you know, w w which he builds up with tone, I wanted to get that mood and that melancholy with the color of this piece. And then the other uh, cartoonist was, is, is John Stanley, <laughs> which isn't his apparent. Um, but he, he, he did Little Lulu, and there's something about the layouts and the way um, I was reading a lot of that to my kids. And, and this book almost, I'm doing more kids' books right now, which is, I feel like this market day is a transition into that kind of kids' book area. Um, and I, I'll just mention briefly that this is, um, I, I've been keeping sketchbooks since the early 80s. And uh, just an important part of, of my, I guess, creative output. It's not something I, you know, I guess I'm, sh I'm sharing it with you now, but uh, I'll, I'll do little story riffs or I'll have, like I did one, uh, this was something that event part of it became a piece for Slate where I, I just did a, dr a New Yorker cartoon, a cartoon a day or like that was like, just helped me so I didn't have to think of what to draw that day. Um, and um, that guy, I, that guy, is, I, I was also like starting this, like the vaguely like my dad, I was starting the cartoon school and I was, when I'm away from my drawing table too long, I get a little squirrely, and I thought, well, you know, you gotta just live where you're at, and I started just drawing people I was in meetings with, and I think that's Peter Laird's business advisor right there. Um, <laughs> anyway. And then this is the last slide. Um, and this is the, the, the cartoon school actually, um, actually happened. <laughs> Um, which is which is which is no one is more surprised than I am, and and you know through people like Michelle Ali, which which Ed mentioned, and Valerie and John, and these great faculty that I teach with, and these amazing students, it's like there's something that kind of again like a little who knows when it'll all go south and it'll be like the Black River School and we just have to shut it down. Uh, but for now, um, it's 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 um it's it still feels like a bit of an exciting place, and uh, this is the post office building and. Um, I feel like this is part of like my collaborative, um, you know, it's, it feels like a real collaborative project and, and whether it was through my days with the stranger as well, I, I, that's part of me that also I enjoy um, kind of working, working with others to kind of for, for some kind of common 
goal. Like I, I feel that coming to Vermont, um, it, it's like the first time I, I feel like a citizen, you know? Um, and I never felt that anywhere I lived before, that like you, you go to the town meetings, you, you, you're, you know, with, with that comes like certain obligations and responsibilities, and I think this is something that, that I adore about, about my, my home. Um, I'd be happy to take a question or two if there is one, and if not, we can just get the room ready for the next, for the next cartoonist. Mr. Corrin. Yeah, you, you mentioned, you gave a very short mention to your time teaching Savannah. Uh, you make the connection between starting the school and your I, teaching experience. Yeah, I taught there. for four years at the Savannah College of Art and Design, and they were very entrepreneurial too. Like they, I, they celebrated their 20th, 20th anniversary, so they did some things that I really admired the way they helped you know, Savannah, everybody was fleeing downtown Savannah and taking those beautiful squares and paving, you know, making them into one into a parking lot. And they, they really helped drive the economic engine, um, you know, to, for the, for, for revitalization of downtown. Um, it was like a teaching boot camp. I had never taught in a program and, and, and it was like three semesters, sometimes four, four classes a semester. That was only the first year. And then I couldn't do it anymore. I was like, pay me half as much. I, I need time to do my comics. Um, so I learned, I, I just tried a lot of different things. I taught a lot. Um, and then, you know, like any place, I learned like what I, what I if, if, this, if I ran a school, this is what I would do. Um, so I learned a lot that way. And I, and I lived in historic downtown Savannah for four years. And uh, um, it was really good. And then, and then I had a kid, and I was like, I'm not raising my kid down here. <laughs> anyway, we moved up north. We moved to Vermont. Yeah. All right. I want to thank everybody for coming out. <laughs>